that guy. He likes to tell stories. Yeah. Stories are a good way to teach people things. <clears throat> so take Jesus said to this man, this was Jesus' story. There was a man, and this is a long, long time ago, but these things happen today, today sometimes too. There was a man who was traveling down the road, probably on his horse or his donkey, and some bad guys, some robbers came up. And they knocked him off, and they beat him up, and they just left him in the ditch. And he was there in the ditch, and he was really, really hurt. The robbers went away and took his money and things. So then along the same road came another guy. And he was a pretty good guy. But he looked at the person in the ditch, and he crossed the street. And he went over to the other side of the road, really. He crossed the road, went over to the other side of the road, didn't do anything. Second man comes along. He was even a holy man that really loved God. He looked at the guy moaning in the ditch, didn't do anything, hurried on by. And the third guy came along, and he was somebody that probably he was a good guy, but they didn't know him, and he came from a different country, and they, some of his, some people said, Maybe he's not very good because he comes from a different place than we do. Now, that's not always right, but that's what maybe they thought. And guess what he did? He stopped. He saw the man with his hurt. He helped him. He found something to kind of wipe up some bandages because he was bleeding. He put him back on his donkey, and he took him back down the road to where there was kind of like a hotel. He took him into the hotel. And he said to the, to the innkeeper, he said, gosh, I found this guy on the side of the road and I really want to help him. And um, here's some money to help pay for his stay with you. Wow. What do you think? <laughs> yeah, thank that guy good. So, you know, back to Jesus' question. Jesus' question was, is your neighbor just the person? It is the person who lives near you. Yeah, it's your neighbor. That's what we call our neighbors. Yeah, it's the person who lives near you. But do um, you think, like, maybe the kids in your classroom could be called neighbors? Could all these guys out here be called neighbors? Yeah. Yeah. What about people um, who live in a different place in Missouri? Could they be neighbors? Yes. Yeah. What about people who live in a different country? What about people who look way different than we look? Could they be our neighbors? Yes. Gosh, you guys are so smart. Yes, you are. That's exactly what Jesus meant. Because what Jesus wanted to say is that it's, it's okay, it's good to say you love somebody. But when you're really showing God's love, it's also that extra special step to care for somebody. To show them that you care for them. And that third man in the story was the one that really cared for the hurt person, wasn't he? So he's saying, God wants us all to care for people and be kind to them and to love them, even if they're not from our Missouri or United States or not anybody that we even know. He's kind of saying, everybody in the world could be our neighbor. And we're, we're showing God's love by caring for them. I'm going to end with one thing. This is what my mother had all kinds of little sayings that she told me growing up. And now I'm grown up and I remember them. And one thing my mother always said, and I want you guys to remember, your mother probably says this too. My mother always said, actions speak louder than words, which means what you do and how you care and treat other people says more than just saying, hi, or I love you. So always try to have very kindest actions and care for other people that need help, okay? And I know you girls do that. This is a book with that story in it. I thought you might want to look at it during church, okay? Loving God, we are grateful for those moments when we experience the incredible splendor of being alive. For mornings when all of creation seems to stir and shake sleep away as we awaken to a fresh new day. 
Bring us back to you, O God. Help us transition from rushing to be here to simply being here. May we delight in the peace of this sacred place beside others who delight in your presence as well. Help us to be honest with you and with ourselves. We have issues squirreled away in our hearts and minds, issues of anger and hurt and resentment, destructive emotions that leech joy from our lives. Help us to release all that is negative within us. Clear out all obstacles that lie between us and you. And as we pause in your stillness, we think of all who need your compassion. Those who are enduring a health crisis. Those who have reached the end of their resources. We slip into complacency far too easily, O oh God. Open our hearts to the suffering in our world today. Those whose lives have been torn apart by violence. Those who are enduring the onslaught of storms. The countless immigrants who are living in fear. We lift each one into the safety of your grace. O oh God, when we leave this chapel, May we be instruments of courage and hope to all we encounter. For we lift our prayer this evening, O God, in the name of Jesus the Christ. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. to justify himself, he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, <clears throat> He passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him, and when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him and bandaged his wood, wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day he took out two denali, gave them to the innkeeper, and said, Take care of him. And when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Now, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Pam mentioned that um, Jesus told lots of stories. And 
One of the stories he told, that we all remember, is the story of the Good Samaritan that she just read. It's interesting to me that uh, out of many of the stories that Jesus told, he told them over several different times, told them in different places, told them on a mountaintop or told them in a valley. But according to the scriptures, the only time Jesus told this story, the Good Samaritan, um, is the time it's recorded in, in Luke's gospel. He told it just once. W.H. Auden um, said uh, quite many years ago, and it, it, it kind of blows me away, the phrase, he says, you can't tell anyone what to do. You can only tell them a story. Now, we all know the story of the Good Samaritan, and uh, we've probably squeezed all the toothpaste out of that tube that we're going to get in some regards. But, but I wanted to focus a little bit this evening on the results of that story. So Jesus tells this story one time, the story of the Good Samaritan. And to everyone who heard that story, Samaritans were evil. They were outcast. They were despicable. They were intolerable. They were the worst form of humanity that you could find. That's the people who heard this story about the Samaritan. That's how they felt. Move forward 2,000 years. The story was only told once. And we have hospitals named Samaritan Hospital. We have hospice and health agencies named after Samaritan. We have agencies that do different mission work out in the community that are called Samaritan. The word Samaritan has taken on a completely different context where once it was the despicable, the intolerable, because of Jesus' one story, those people have transitioned into being the heroes, the people who are really serving and doing great things for us. It seems to me that, um, that Jesus, if we look at his teachings, that one of the primary aspects of his teaching was he was trying to teach us how to belong. He was trying to teach us how to make other people belong. Um, so what I want to do this evening, remember Auden said, you can't tell anyone anyone what to do. You can only tell them a story. I'm going to just tell several stories. And hopefully some of those stories will somehow speak to your understanding of what it means to belong. First, I want to point out that belonging, and Jesus would have known this, is not a desire. It's not a hope. Belonging is a basic human need. Belonging is not anything as simple as signing up or showing up or paying your dues. Belonging is a need. Maslow nailed that down for us years ago with Maslow's need hierarchy. And what Maslow was saying, he used better language probably, but he said that basically if we want to be self-actualized, if we want to be the people God created us to be, then we have to have certain needs filled. And the basic need he mentioned is we have to have our physiological needs met. We have to uh, have shelter and food. The next need we have is the need to be safe. And then the very next need is the need to belong. Belong to families, belong to a community, belong to a neighborhood. We have to have that sense of belonging. Now, what I want to point out is that belonging is not the same as fitting in. My, my mother had a, uh, a jigsaw puzzle she had put together, framed, and put into the office of our uh, family business. And it was a picture of our, our county courthouse. We had an absolutely amazingly beautiful county courthouse. And for a centennial or one of those celebrations, uh, they had produced this picture of the courthouse and made it into a puzzle. It's old, a jigsaw puzzle of people. 
And my mom had purchased one with the idea of putting it together, framing it, putting it up on the wall in the office. Um, my mom also bought several little buttons like, uh, you know, like commemorating the centennial. Every once in a while, if you were walking in her office, then you would have seen the picture of the courthouse with a commemorative button glued down near the lower right hand corner. And people always would comment on how beautiful that was and how, I wish I would have thought to have, you know, saved it. I wish I would have put that, my button on there, you know, that kind of thing. Beautiful. And my mom would usually just kind of smile and say, eh, there's a story there. <laughs> my mom put that puzzle together. And I think everybody in my family remembers the evening she finished the puzzle. Because when she finished the puzzle, it was missing one piece. And so she let out her, well, she said some words I won't say here. But anyway, um, we all gather. You know how you do. You all know, get together and you start looking under the table and under chairs and you start seeing if the dog or the cat got a hold of it and put it somewhere else. And we finally found the piece. Interesting thing about that piece. It belonged to the puzzle. It had the same shades of blues and grays that the puzzle had. It had the same backing that the puzzle had, the same depth of the puzzle. It did not fit. It was the missing piece, but it didn't fit. And so what my mom did was she just took the button and put that over the spot, okay? So I just, just to kind of get our minds working about belonging and fitting in. I went to the hospital, Methodist Hospital in Indianapolis, Indiana, on Meridian Street. I was in a hurry, but I wanted to stop and have a prayer with one of the ladies from our church who did not have family. She was in the intensive care unit. I got into the hospital, went up to the right floor, the doors of the elevator opened, right up into the waiting room for the ICU, and I, I stepped out into the, the waiting room, and the people, most people in waiting room for ICU, there's a, a type of uh, clothing you're supposed to wear. You know, they were wearing like pajama bottoms and house slippers, and you know, they were just there for the long haul. Different mixes, races of people there, and back in the corner, I saw uh, what looked like three African-American black bikers wearing their vests, their colors, and everything. Didn't think much about anything, but I just kind of walked over, told the receptionist who I was, wanted to see Francis. She let me in, I went back, had a prayer with Francis left the ICU, crossed the waiting room, got into the elevator, pushed the button, and immediately these three bikers, two, well, two bikers and one of their girlfriends, got onto the elevator. And someone apparently had not teach them, or taught them, I'm sorry, the proper elevator etiquette, because when the doors closed, they were still standing there looking at me instead of looking at the door, which you're supposed to look at the door when you're in an elevator, you know? Um, and they wanted to know who I was. <laughs> Told me I was a minister. How did you get in there? I said, well, they let me in. And, you know, and, I, and come to find out, the hospital would not let them in to see a member of their, I would say gang, they said club. <laughs> uh, they wouldn't let, let them in to see a member of their club that was in intensive care because they were not family. So I told them to follow me. I said, well, just take your lead from me. And we went back up, <laughs> held the doors open, we walked across the waiting room there with me, and I looked at the receptionist, she looked up and said, what? I said, we'd like to see Roger so-and-so. She says, we? I said, we? I'm, I'm a minister. These are elders in my congregation, and they would like to visit Roger. Have a little prayer. She let us in. I couldn't stay. I was just there a few minutes with them and everything. And I got ready to leave. I said, okay, I'm out of here. And the guy grabbed my arm. I said, thought we were going to have a prayer. <laughs> so we had a prayer. <laughs> the bottom line is that they belonged in that intensive care. They didn't fit in but they belonged there. I remember going to the bar that they sort of all 
claimed as their own one time, and I walked in, and they welcomed me with open arms, and they were, greeted me, and da, da, da. they did everything they could to make me feel welcome, um, but I didn't fit in. I didn't go back. I remember a downtown church. The board was meeting, and somebody at the board meeting complained to all of the homeless people sleeping in their sidewalks and sleeping on the steps and the doorways and even in the dumpster at the church. And somebody suggested that they ask the police to increase the patrols. And this little old woman said, why don't we, instead of that, why don't we invite them to come into the fellowship hall and sleep here? We could buy mats and we could even make them dessert. And probably they wouldn't have gone with that idea, but there's something about in the church when you're talking about desserts and sleeping versus police, you know, it, it kind of wins out. And so they decided to invite the people in to sleep. The men come in to sleep, and it did not go as the church intended. Um, there were several fights. One person had some kind of a seizure. They had to call EMTs. Um, the toilet was uh, plugged solid. Um, Somebody stole all the toilet paper and paper towels. And the main thing is that the people weren't grateful. The men weren't grateful. The guy that was making ice cream sundaes for everybody said he brought strawberry and, and chocolate toppings. And he said not a single person accepted his sundae without asking, you know, do you have any other flavors? Is it all vanilla? Is it all? And no gratitude. Another board meeting, and somebody said, you know, obviously we didn't know what we were getting into. We need to make, uh, we need to readdress this issue. But old woman raises her hand again, and she said, yes, we forgot who we were serving. We forgot why we were doing it. We need to make some adjustments so they feel like they belong. They're not going to fit in. But maybe we can make them feel like they belong. And I think about some of the people from Nicaragua and Cuba and Venezuela right now that are trying to come into our country because we have this motto or whatever that says, bring me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses yearning to breathe free. And they've got to say, man, that's where I belong. I'm tired, I'm poor, I'm huddled. <laughs> But when they get here, they find that so many of us are saying, no, 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 no. You don't fit in. And what's really painful, and then I'll, I'll shut up. What's really painful is when we ourselves decide that we don't belong somewhere. Just two little stories. A college co-ed came home for winter break and wanted to meet with me. I, I said, let's have lunch. And she said, no, I just, something's bothering me. I want to talk. She sat in the office. She had been raised in the church. She was everybody's little girl. And she said, college life is well. College life is good. She said, it's not like I expected. She said, I, there are parties all the time. And she said, there's lots of alcohol and there's drugs. And she said, for a girl like me, it's free. She said, I've got lots of boyfriends, more boyfriends than I should have. She said, I've been sleeping with them. She just sat there. I didn't know what I was supposed to do. I didn't know if I was supposed to be like a priest and absolve any sins or whatever, you know. And I finally asked, I said, is your lifestyle troubling you? And she said, no. She said, my lifestyle is not troubling me. What's troubling me is that I am not troubled by my lifestyle. Marinate that 
with that for a while. So about two and a half years ago, I had a man come to me, a, a fellow that I just dearly love. He told me he was going to get a divorce. A young man, good man, lovely couple, but he's going to get a divorce. He said, we're already separated. And so I asked him, have you seen a therapist? No, he said, that won't work. I said, really, you know, a good therapist can do amazing things. I said, why don't you just give it a try, see a therapist? He said, no, therapy won't reach this. And when I asked him what was wrong, he said, and this is back when we were having all the border crisis stuff going on. He said, my wife thinks it's all right to keep children in cages. I, I, I said, you know, I said, That's, we all have political differences. And he said, this is not political. I don't belong with a person who thinks it's all right to keep children in cages. It ain't easy belonging. It ain't easy fitting in. I think that's one of the reasons why worship is so important to me is when I come to worship, I always feel like I belong, even on those times when I don't seem to fit in. 